week of a, of a teaching series called Hello World. And one of the things we've been doing is podcasting the sermon prep that goes into this. So if you're really interested in a little more in-depth thing, you can go to Suncoast Community Church on YouTube, just do a search on YouTube, and you'll see Hello World, and you'll see uh, Ryan and Brett and I talking about the passage that's coming up for the week. It kind of gives you a little insight of what's going on in our minds before I stand up here on a day like today. But we started this series with uh, talking about creation. In Genesis 1, there's the account of creation. God created the heavens and the earth, and he, there was evening, there was morning, day one. There was evening, there was morning, day two. Then the second week, we talked about the creation of Adam and Eve and the garden, and how that the importance of the story is the beginning of consciousness, that human beings wake up to the concept of life and death, and, and we examine blame, how this is not my fault, which is what Adam said in Eve as well. But the garden is about the innocence of life, but how that we've moved beyond that. In chapter 4, Brett did a great job last week at introducing us to Cain and Abel, how these two brothers presented their sacrifices to God, and one was acceptable, the other was not, and Cain was so full of anger that, that God basically challenged Cain and said, why are, is your face so downcast? What he really said was, keep looking up. This is not all, you're, you will be accepted if you just keep looking up. And he killed his brother out of spite and anger and frustration. Today we jump ahead and we're looking at the flood story, Noah and the flood. It's a story about humanity and the consequences of the, of the choices we make. So I'm going to jump in. We're going to read a few verses. This is many chapters, so I'm not going to read it all, just a few verses. And I'm going to tell you some things today that uh, at the end of the teaching, you're going to go, well, I've never heard that before. Fair enough? And if you have, maybe you just, you have, but I don't think so. We'll see. Here's the verses. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth. And that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth. And his heart was deeply troubled. So the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I have created. And with them the animals, the birds, and the creatures that move along the ground. For I regret that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. I mean, Noah, it says in the next verse, he walked with God. I love this story. It has so many different interpretations over the years, but I, I love what my brother-in-law did many years ago. He's in television and, television and radio advertising. And my father-in-law many years ago owned a fence and lumber company on Cortez Road in Braden called Cypress Fence and Lumber. So his son came down, my brother-in-law, he said, Dad, let me help you. You could do some, mar do some marketing for you. Let me do an ad. And he loved to do these comedic ads on radio. And he made one for the radio. And it played on the radio here locally. And it was something like this. Hey, God, yeah, what's going on? He said, uh, yeah, Noah, I want you to build an ark. He said, okay. And then a friend says, well, what, what are you going to use? He said, he said well, I got to use, use wood. And of course, I use cypress because it's cypress fence and lumber. And this, the friend said, but, but in the Bible, it doesn't say cypress wood. It said, go for wood. He said, no, what he really was saying is go for wood. And what, if he went for wood, he'd get cypress. <laughs> now, that's an interpretation that might be stretching a little bit. But no more than some of the other interpretations I hear on a regular basis. It's so easy to miss the deeper meaning of this story. And if you read it at its elementary level, and I'm convinced that all of us have, what you'll discover is God is angry with the people of the world because they're evil. He is so hurt that he wants to destroy everyone. Do you see any problems with this viewpoint? I mean, he tells Noah, gather two, two of each species in the ark, and the rains come for 40 days, and everyone in the world is killed except Noah and his family and all these animals. For it rained for 40 days, but for 150 days, it says they were on the ark, six months, the ark contained all the animals in the world, two of each species. Now, if you read this story literally, you'll probably want to build an ark and it gives all the dimensions like the guy in Kentucky did. And if you go there, God bless you. But that is totally missing the point of this story because it's probably just a story, probably never was a real occurrence. But some people like to take what is literal and turn it into factual, and in so doing, they miss the real truth of this story. And I'm gonna explain it to you today. And when you leave here, you're gonna go, oh boy, I may not have heard it that way before, and that's okay. And here's the thing, if you wanna believe Noah had an ark, that's fine. 
I mean, but, but as I nudge you, I would say, but do you still believe in Santa Claus? Yes. Fine. <laughs> That's, then, then you'll probably have no trouble with the ark. <laughs> but, but if you miss the application of the story, it's a damaging application. For example, if you want to see this completely literal, it shows a God who makes mistakes, it shows a God who gets angry, who destroys all of humanity, and not to mention all of the animals in the world. Do you think Peter would like that? No. I mean, all the animals in the world are going to be destroyed. He's, he's so screwed up that he wants a do-over with creation. Now, folks, that has lots of theological problems for me, but I don't read it literally. It's inconsistent with the overall teachings of Jesus, and honestly, it misses the point of the story. And that's and these first 11 chapters of Genesis are not to be read literally. They're to be read figuratively. There, there's a lot of metaphor in here. There's a lot of, you know, they're just stories with great truths, but not to be meant as actual factual stories. Creation, Adam and Eve, temptation, failure, expelled from the garden. Now the flood story. And this one I want to share. I want to share three things with you today that I think is the meat of what the reason this story has survived thousands of years. And it's not really about an ark. But here's the story. Here's, here's the truth one. You can fill in the blank if you want. When society loses its moral foundation, the chaos can be devastating. The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become, that every inclination of our heart was evil all the time. And God in another translation said he was grieved that he had made the earth at all. His heart was filled with pain. What happened? According to the story, Humanity lost its moral foundation. The entire society, understand this follows the story of Cain and Abel. The entire society began to take the course of Cain. He began to look downcast. He began to see what he could do for himself. The intent of his heart was evil all the time. And history teaches us that when societies lose their, form, their moral foundation, disaster is at hand. You can look at Greece until 146 B.C., Greece was a superpower. Fifth century B.C., Greece was in Homer, the Iliad, the Odyssey. All the great works were done. I mean, but 146 B.C., because of the moral situation, the moral loss, they lost their position. And 476 A.D. is when Rome lost its position of power. They kind of picked it up from Greece in 146 B.C. And moral degradation. If you want to read about the wars just before World War II, Japan attacked China, and the rape of Nanking in like 1937 is an atrocity that's a blight on human history. What they did to the people in China, hundreds of thousands were killed and murdered and mutilated. Terrible atrocities. And then you look at Nazi Germany in World War II. What happened to six million Jews? You can see this moral foundation when it loses its, its focus, it's devastating. And generally speaking, the loss of moral values leads to the disintegration of societies. Sociologists claim that societies generally decline. Why? Because they lose values. Peter Berger writes a book, uh, he's a sociologist about religion, writes a book called The Sacred Canopy, and he says religion really is important though in society. There's a place that religion holds that it, it, it maintains moral values and it keeps people alive because they have purpose. I was in a North Florida, just this past week. And I, I met with a couple of buddies of mine, and we've been friends for many decades. And I began to ask them about the church they attend. They said, one of them said, well, I'm not going to church much anymore. The other guy said, yeah, I go, but there's only about 30 people there. I said, well, what's, what's going on? What's happening? And we don't know. You know, people are just not interested. I said, well, why do we go to church? Why is church attendance dropping, so it seems? And then I began to ask a better question. What is the function of the church? What should it be? And, and maybe even deeper, what is the greatest good the church could do for humanity? And we began to brainstorm about a few things. And some of the things we landed I thought were good. The church is there to provide some moral instruction. Try to help you do things a little better. It also provides hope and meaning for those who've lost hope and meaning. Because we are people of hope. We're people who want to not just look downward all the time in this, in this downcast view like Cain had, but we want to start looking up. One day a friend of mine uh, asked a retired pastor, he said, do you know why I should go to church? 
And this young guy asked this pastor, and the pastor said, well, you go to church to worship God. He said, well, I can worship anywhere. He said, well, you go to church because you need to go to church. He goes, I don't feel like I need to go to church. And I interrupted the conversation because I was curious. So I asked this person, so what could the church provide that you might need? If you don't need the church, what do you need? And he would come up with, you know, a place where like-minded people could gather, maybe begin to be challenged to change the world. I'm good with that, aren't you? I mean, I want Suncoast to be a place that challenges us to change the world, a place where the, we can share resources and help the oppressed in our society, like changing the oil, giving away cars, doing a sort day for mothers helping mothers. There are many other things that we do. Even this week, you know, there, there, this church is providing lunch for all the teachers in the school this week. Just some of the things we do to show people we care about them, we love them. So a place, though, where I'm not judged, but I'm challenged to be the best version of me I can be. Now, I want to challenge you to be the best version of me that you could be. <laughs> that doesn't work for you either, does it? I mean, I'm struggling with me. But can, wouldn't it be great to challenge you to be the best version that you could possibly be of yourself? Which leads me to the second thought today, and it's this. Aim toward your highest possible life. What does it mean when it says, Noah walked with God. I know earlier in chapter 2 and 3 of Genesis that God took a walk in the cool of the evening in the Garden of Eden and he called out to Adam, wanting Adam to walk with him. And Adam hid. God calls out, where are you, Adam? I'm hiding. Why? Because I don't have any clothes on. Did you eat from the tree that I told you not to eat from? Yeah, God, I did. Well, my eyes are open and now I see things in a different light. What does it mean to walk with God? Noah walked with God faithfully. So let me make this more personal. How do I walk with God? It's a choice. And I think one of the ways you and I could walk with God, it's begin to try to aim my life toward its highest good. Because I think that's where God lives is in your life toward your highest good. I think I want to be the best person I can be. How do I do that specifically? Well, I, can, I think I can begin with some simple responses. I think it's important to tell the truth. We've become a society that has forgotten how to tell the truth. People answer the phone and they say, no, he's not here and he's right there. And your kids are learning what it means to not tell the truth because they see it from parents, how it's modeled. I just think it's important to tell the truth. I, when Becky and I got married, I was astounded at how honest she could be. Because we were early dating and early married. I was not nearly as honest as she was. I grew up with eight brothers and sisters, and you had to be a little devious to survive. <laughs> I learned it from my parents. And now I'd say it's so much better to be honest, and she's taught me how important it is to be honest because it's consistency. So is there ever time that someone always likes to play this? Was there ever time I should tell a lie? Yes. Someone shows up at your door with a rifle and says, where's your wife? I want to kill her. You then can have my permission to say, she's not here. <laughs> Fair enough. But that's never going to happen in your lifetime. Tell the truth. If you tell the truth all the time, except for that one exception that never happens, I'm going to be okay with that. But when you tell the truth, you become trustworthy. When you speak, people really believe what you say. Be honest. Don't lie. Don't cheat. Don't steal not even a postage stamp. It's better that way. Deceit filled the heart of the community in Noah's day. Every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. The people in this story were walking away from God, not with God. They're walking away from moral principles, walking away from being a supportive community, walking away from truth, honesty, and honor. The call to live a higher life is a way you and I can restore society. See, I think we really can change the world if we aim up toward our highest good. Society can, can follow that same thing, and society will thrive. If we aim down toward evil, society degenerates. But I think the call to Christianity is for us to be so much more than we are. If you want to make things better, if we do, and I think we do, stop doing stupid things, right? Right? Let me just stop doing stupid things, but I'm addicted to stupid. I know. 
I am too. Every three months, you know, it's like an addictive behavior. I've got to have stupid. But I need to stop doing those stupid things. I need to start aiming toward the better things in my life. And this story, the flood story, one of the great truths that we just gloss over because we're building a replica of an ark is that if the structure of our society is corrupt, social destruction is coming. I'm concerned about that. Aren't you? I mean, our society is not quite in the area of moral destruction, but I surely think we could aim higher. I think that if enough people aim down at the same time, especially in political leaders around the globe, if they all aim down at the same time, we could be in a real mess. But if we could learn to aim higher, when the storm and the chaos of life comes, we can find stability. See, what Jesus taught us, look up, aim higher, be kind, be generous, be involved with others' lives. I think those are important qualities. My father-in-law, Becky's dad, passed away in 2001. His name was Frank Kraft. Frank was in his 80s when he passed away, but he was so good to me. You know, some people have struggles with their in-laws, and I understand the jokes, and I tell them, but with my in-laws, they really were wonderful people. My father-in-law was a great listener. I'd say, out of all the people I've known in life, this guy was the best listener I ever knew. He, he really would pay attention to what you were saying. Sometimes when people are listening, you look in their eyes, and they're not looking at you. They're thinking about the next story they can tell, not about the story you're telling. But I want to listen better. I want to love greater. I want to be more benevolent. I want to learn to be more gracious. I want to live my life as a reflection of something greater in me. And that's when I walk with God. See, walking with God leads to a life of greater order. Walking with God is not living out of control. It's not this selfless pursuit. It's, it's learning how to be in community. We walk with God together. Walk with God. What I discovered in this story with Noah, if he walked with God, and if we walked to God, not only did it affect him, but it also affected his kids, his family. His ark was created to take him through the storms of life because he walked with God. Now, we won't be immune from the storm. Trust me, the storms in life are going to happen, period. There's going to be chaos in your life. If not in yours, I'll tell you about mine. In 1985, I lost a brother to suicide. Chaos. 1987, his second son killed himself the same way his dad did. 1993, my dad died of a massive heart attack, disrupting the whole family flow. 2001, my father-in-law passed away from you know, complications from Alzheimer's. 2016, three years ago, I lost my next oldest brother, the next one older than me, to cancer and leukemia. If you've not gone through relational heartaches and pain with that, you will. But what matters in life is how you cope in the storm. See, I want to live my life trusting God. We see this throughout the Bible in many areas. The prophet Habakkuk, wonderful story. This short book to where he looks out over the walls of the city and he sees the enemy camped around him and said, we're not going to survive this. Why, God, why are those people who are not as good as we are going to win this battle? How long are we going to have to wait? And God sends a message and says, if you just read this message, it will help you in your scope of life. It will answer all your questions. And he really didn't answer why they were there or how long he was going to wait. What he really answered is, the righteous will live by faithfulness. You say, well, what does that mean? See, it's not, it's not just about faith. You say, I want to have faith, but that's more than that. It's not even about a belief system. It's not about a statement of beliefs. Often we're asked, where's your statement of beliefs? And I go, we don't have one. Why? Because we believe that walking with God is not a statement, it's a lifestyle. Walking with God is a daily aim toward reaching a higher good. This is the answer to life's questions then and now is aim high, live high, follow the teachings of Jesus, and your heart will shape not only your family and provide provision for them, but also to shape your community around you which leads to the last thought of the day. It's this. As we follow the teachings of Jesus, we discover meaning in life. Carl Jung, psychologist, says, modern people don't see God because they don't look low enough. See, I think God is not up there in the clouds on some cosmic throne. I think the way I understand Genesis is that the breath of God 
is all around us. He's in the oxygen. He's in the breath of life. He's the spirit that's in this room. The spirit of Jesus that lived 2,000 years ago is still alive today and still breathing into hearts and lives and challenges me to look up and to aim higher and to be a better version of me. But many people are often looking for God in the wrong places. Sometimes he's in the weather. And you've heard me talk about that, the weather God. I don't believe in that God either. Or the God of, can you believe all these coincidences? I don't think God is just a coincidence. See, Jesus came for us to understand that God is all around us. And no greater picture of that than we find in Matthew 5 through 7, Sermon on the Mount. What did Jesus teach? A practical kingdom. Life, I mean, seen by those who put into practice truth, love, kindness, and honesty. Noah walked with God. And then we go back, and then you see Habakkuk walking with God, and you see Jesus walking with God. And it's this lifestyle. It's not what you believe that's more important. It's how you live that's more important. You could say, I believe all these things and still live your life not valuing people and devaluing people all the time. I think it's so much more important to let the Spirit of Christ live in you. What does that Spirit look like? Well, if someone asks you for your coat, you give them the shirt off your back. If someone slaps you on the face, you don't retaliate. It's not about starting a war. Simply learn to turn the other cheek. Jesus taught us about the big picture. And I love it when he says, consider the lilies of the field. They neither toil nor spin. They don't stress out. They just bloom. And if your heavenly father cares so much about you, why can't we get that? So what does that mean? Simply this. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. See, humanity can choose to grow, achieve, aim high, and blossom, or can stagnate, look down, do damage to the world. So here's a challenge. What if you and I began to change? What if I challenged you and myself? We're going to live up to a higher standard. What if we were going to decide we're going to aim higher and, and really live our life at a, at a different level? What if we decided, and this is my challenge to you, what if you decided this week that you're going to tell the truth every moment of every day this week? No matter what anybody asks you, and if somebody comes in and wants you to shoot somebody, you tell them no. But beyond that, just 1%. What if your life was better 1% this week than it was last week, or 1% the week after that? Do you see the moral trajectory? Folks, we really are about changing the world. What if the aim of following Jesus was to change the way I use language? I use it more kindly. What if the aim was for me to drive down these roads with less intensity? Yeah, that's you. What if the aim were to speak kindness despite frustration? What if my aim was to arrive at all my appointments on time? What if my aim was not to be frustrated when others are not on time? What if I begin to value other people as God's kids? Can we do it? Of course we can. The motivation comes from the spirit of Jesus that we proclaim and we speak it every week. That that same spirit that was brooding over the face of the deep and created something wonderful out of chaos. The same spirit that was with Noah when he walked with God is available for you and for me to walk with God. So he gave us a few tips. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. If you aim for this kingdom, the trajectory of your life will be so much higher and the other things really will become insignificant. Another truth, don't judge so you won't be judged. With the same judgment you judge others, you'll be judged. So don't judge, just love. And lastly, love one another deeply because love does cover a multitude of sins. Let me pray for you. Father, we open this story today talking about an ark, but we land it talking about our hearts, how that we can walk with God and find value and find our lives blooming like the lilies of the field, or we can look downward and inward and make it all about me and mine and miss the great opportunities for life. Father, move among us today, challenge us to be honest and truthful, and as we do that, we honor Jesus. We follow him. We pray in his name. Amen. Would you stand, please? I'm going to tell you a story in closing. And as I do, remind you, if you want to pray, someone's up front. I'd be delighted to pray with you. But I was talking to uh, a friend this week about his Mac computer. 
He said, his Mac computer is a few years old. It's a notebook computer that he said, it's running so slow. And he said, I just, you know, I don't know why. He said, it's time to get a new computer. Sometimes, you know, you have them for a few years. And he said, but before I did that, I backed up my computer and I went in and did a complete reset. Put everything in the Mac back to its original settings. Got rid of all the upgrades and software, all the programs that were on there. And he said, just the basics, just the original settings. I said, what happened? He said, man, that thing runs like a scalded dog. It is so fast. It works so great. I said, that's amazing. Reminded me of being in Israel. 35 of us were on the Sea of Galilee one rainy day. And after that, we went to a restaurant where we had St. Peter's fish for lunch. And after we finished our meal, we were looking out in the rainy, cloudy days. We saw a rainbow right on the Sea of Galilee. A rainbow. You could see both ends of the rainbow. We were snapping pictures of it. It was beautiful. And I just wonder how many rainbows you and I, or us collectively, have seen in the world. But you know, the Noah story mentions the origin of the rainbow. What if? Here's my what if. What if every person who saw a rainbow, or every time you and I see a rainbow, we hit the reset button, and we go back to the basics. We get rid of a lot of the stuff that's been piled on us all the years, and we simply go back to loving more simply, aiming our lives a little higher, being more honest. We resolve once again to follow the teachings of Jesus Christ. I pushed that button this week. I reset a lot of things. I remember why I'm here, to help all of us set our sights a little higher and remind you that God loves you today. And so do I. God bless. Thanks for coming. Thank you.